German, Germanic peoples. A.D. B.C., the ancient Greeks, for the first time, used the word Germanic in a book. But, more notable is the account of the famous Roman Julius Caesar in his book The Gallic Wars. In 113 BC, the Cimbri, a Germanic tribe, frustrated with their search for food and land, they crossed the Roman border in today's Naricum region of Austria, encountering and defeating a Roman army for the first time. Four years later, in 109 BC, this Germanic tribe, together with another Germanic tribe, the Teutons, appeared in southern Gaul and defeated a Roman army that was trying to expel them. Afterwards, these Germanic tribes, once again returning in greater numbers, again defeated the two Roman armies led by the consuls. This defeat was also a great loss for ancient Rome. After that, the Romans became aware of the barbarian threat on their borders. So, they sent a powerful army to fight against the barbarians, one of the early observers of the Germanic tribes, the conqueror of Gaul, Julius Caesar. One day in 58 BC, in the mountains west of the Rhine, two armies of different styles met head-on. One army wore the standard Roman battle dress, carried the eagle shield marked SPQR, and was commanded by Julius Caesar, a title of honor used by many later monarchs. The other one, wearing a bestial cap and coat and carrying a banner with the head of a certain animal, was Ariovistus, a chief of a Germanic tribe. The two armies met and war inevitably broke out, and they were marked in red on the land that would later be known as Germany. In this great battle, the Teutons were defeated and Ariovistus fled. In the decades that followed the Romans continued to attack the Germanic peoples, while at the same time looking for ways to divide and assimilate them. One of the simplest methods was the irresistible temptation of the common man to mix Romans and Germans regularly within 30 miles of each side of the Roman border. While the Germans traded cattle and slaves for Roman bronze and furs, Roman language, culture and politics came to the tribes along with the wheels of trade. At the same time, the Romans moved the sons of the chiefs of the Germanic tribes to Rome. They gave them material benefits and made them grow up like Romans, so that the tribes would function in the Roman way. In fact, they were happy to serve the Roman Empire, because they could get more land and wealth and continue to enjoy citizenship in the international Roman world. To this group of barbarian tribes, the Romans called them the Germanic peoples. However, when asked about their affiliation, many Germanic tribes would answer that they belonged to the Lombards, the Vandals, the Frisians, or the Goths. For the Germanic peoples, the name they preferred to remember was never the defeated Ariovistus, but Arminius, the leader of the Cherusci tribe. During the reign of Augustus, Rome invaded Germania, conquering as far as the Elba, and established a Germanic province east of the Rhine, appointing Publius Quinctilius Verus as commander-in-chief of the Roman army in Germania. Verus tried to introduce the Roman rent and legal system, which, however, caused strong resentment among the Germans. For the Germans, only slaves paid taxes, so Varus ordered severe punishment for those who opposed it, which caused even more anger among the Germans, and this fell into the eyes of the Germanic nobleman Arminius. Arminius, the 25-year-old military chief, commanded the Germanic detachment of the Roman imperial army in one great honor and Roman citizenship. In 9 AD Arminius unites several Germanic tribes, first succeeds in gaining the trust of Varus and convinces the Teutonic tribes to send troops. In September, Varus learns from Arminius about the Germanic rebellion, so he leads three Roman legions to put down the rebellion. When Varus reached the Tuttleberg Forest, near Osnabrück in present-day northwestern Germany, a majestic trumpet sounded, and countless arrows, which formed a wave of death, swallowed the lives of the Roman soldiers. The battle-hardened Roman soldiers quickly erected their shields and prepared for the battle, but the forest limited their space, and the three Roman legions were defeated after four days of fighting against the Germanic army, and Varus himself committed suicide as a result. When Augustus learned that the incompetence of Varus had led to the destruction of all three Roman legions, he cursed, Varus, give me back my legions. In 1875, a huge statue of Arminius appeared in Tuttleberg Forest. Wilhelm, the German emperor at the time, believed that the real founding battle was not a series of modern battles such as the defeat of the Austrians and the capture of the French king, 
but the Battle of Tuttleberg Forest, which took place 2000 years ago. Because after this battle, the Romans were driven across the Rhine and avoided assimilation into Rome. Between the 1st and 3rd centuries BC, the Romans managed to disrupt and control many Germanic tribes, both inside and outside the borders. However, from the 4th century onwards, these Germanic tribes, with the participation of the Huns, Avars, Alans, and Mazars who had migrated westward, began to challenge the Romans. In 166, 25 tribes coveted Rome's borders, constituting a precursor to the shadow that loomed over the empire. Rome itself, in the midst of civil strife and civil war, had to withdraw Roman legions from its borders in order to ensure stability at home, despite the porousness of its borders. When, in the last 25 years of the 3rd century, the barbarians crossed the eastern borders of Rome unopposed. These forced Rome to integrate the barbarian chiefs and armies with the Roman military forces, conscripting the Franks, Alamans, Goths and Saxons into the allied forces. To replace the Roman soldiers who maintained the internal defense, and the Roman legions were sent to the frontier to defend against some new tribes that were trying the borders of the empire. However, the Roman legions sent to the frontier suffered two great defeats. The first battle was an attempt to stop the westward expansion of the Persians near Tigris. As a result, Julian, the Roman emperor, was killed in battle along with his army. The second battle was even more life and death, in 376, at the Adrian fortress near present-day Istanbul. Forced by the Huns, the poor and vulnerable Visigoths, led by Alavivus and Fritigern, crossed the Roman border. Like many foreign tribes that had settled in the empire, the Visigoths agreed to submit to and serve Rome. However, upon their arrival, the Visigoths were targeted by the marauding Roman army. The result was a revolt of the Goths, joined by other barbarians who had settled in the empire and had similar experiences to the Goths. In August 378, the Roman Emperor Valens, overly convinced of his superiority, led 35,000 elite Roman legions with heavy armor against a coalition of Goths and Alans led by Fritigium. As a result, the Goths and Alans, who outnumbered the Romans three to one, were defeated and the Roman Emperor and two-thirds of his army died on the battlefield. Thereafter, four years later in 382, the Visigoths returned to their homeland in the southeastern Danube as allies of Rome and established themselves within the Roman Empire. With the conversion of the Visigoths to Arianism, also known as the Anti-Trinitarians, Roman Catholicism also began to spread in the western part of the Roman Empire. As we entered the 5th century, two Germanic peoples dominated the decisive phase of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. One was Flavius Stilicho, a Roman of half-Vandal blood. His father was a Vandal cavalry officer in the army of the Eastern Roman Empire, and Stilicho rose from the ranks of a common soldier to marry the adopted niece of Theodosius the Great. This relationship made Stilicho the commander of the Western Roman army. Thereafter, Theodosius appointed him as regent of Honorius, the ten-year-old royal son and future emperor of the Western Roman Empire. Honorius also married two of Stilicho's daughters, and these brought the two families even closer together. The other, Alaric, was the chief of the Goths at that time. In 392, the two armies clashed for the first time and Alaric the Goth was defeated. Alaric and his defeated army would have been executed on the battlefield if Rome had not needed such an allied army in the service of the Goths. In 394, Alaric's army, which took part in the Battle of the Frigidus in which Theodosius punished Arbogast. On the first day of battle, the Goths lost half their army. Alaric thought to have paid a great sacrifice, he expected to receive the post of general, and his warriors wanted the land. But, despite the enormous cost, the empire avoided mentioning it. This loss exploded in another Gothic revolt, when Stilicho and Alaric met again in battle. In the meantime, Theodosius had died and Stilicho, now regent, was in command of the Roman Empire's army. In 397, Stilicho defeated Alaric again, however, Stilicho did not kill Alaric. He needed the Goths to defend him against the new wave of barbarians sweeping through the Roman Empire. Stilicho gave the Goths a new home in Macedonia and appointed Alaric as commander of the Roman army in Illyria. 
However, in order to prevent the Goths from establishing a true Gothic state in the area close to Rome, he denied Alaric civil authority. In 408, as Honorius grew older, Stilicho became the greatest obstacle and was executed for rebellion after listening to slanderous rumors. As a result of Stilicho's downfall and execution, the Roman Senate carried out an inhumane massacre of the families of the barbarian allies in Italy, and thousands of barbarians living peacefully in Italy were slaughtered. The killing of the Romans led to the addition of thousands of non-Romans to the Alaric army. So in 409, Alaric began to march on Rome, besieging the city three times and, on the third occasion, invading it. For three days in August 410, Gothic soldiers sacked the city of Rome, and as Alaric was about to continue his invasion of Africa southward, he suddenly fell ill and died. Alaric's successor, Athulf, led the Goths to Narbonne, their new homeland in the Western Roman Empire. Through negotiations with the Roman Emperor, the Goths reached a new treaty with Rome, allowing the Goths to live in Gaul for a short time as allies of Rome. After 476, the Christian bishops began to fill the vacancies of political and administrative managers in the great cities of the empire. They used and praised the name of Rome as if it were theirs, and indeed, Rome did become theirs. In late antiquity and throughout the Middle Ages, the Germanic and other tribal populations were indoctrinated with the idea that they should recognize the Roman Church as a civilization above all others, and that it should be protected and obeyed by the tribes. Fortunately for the declining Roman Empire and the rising Christian Church, the most influential tribes, embraced a culture other than the tribes. Many of the tribal kingdoms that replaced the Roman Empire fell at the feet of the Roman Church just as they had fallen at the feet of the Roman Empire. This obedience allowed Christian beliefs and Roman language, law and administration to coexist peacefully with Germanic. These Western European worlds in the making, where the Franks absorbed the traditional strengths of Rome and the barbarians themselves, eschewed mutual exclusion. Despite the attempts of the French and Germans to distance themselves from each other, both claimed to be the true successors of the Franks, yet both shared a common Frankish barbarian ancestry. In the late 5th century, a new Frankish dynasty, the Merovingian dynasty, emerged. In the Merovingian dynasty, Clovis, one of the many small Frankish kings, was born an Arian Christian. He then married Clotilde, the daughter of King Burgundy, an Orthodox Christian. After the birth of their first child, Clotilde pestered Clovis to abandon his heretical Arianism. With both religion and marriage in mind, Clovis converted to Christianity. After his baptism, he gained the support of the Catholic Church, and the Franks were supported by the local Gauls and Romans. In 507, Clovis, starting from northern Gaul, defeated the Thuringians in the east, the Alamans in southwest Germany, defeated the Alsatians in northern Switzerland, defeated the Aryan Goths in southwestern Gaul. Almost all the Visigoths were driven out of Gaul. After these series of victories, Clovis, with impeccable perfection, reminded Rome and Byzantium of who he and his people now were. At the time Clovis was dependent on the Eastern Roman Emperor Anastasius, and was competing with Theodoric, the ruler of the Italian Ostrogoths, for the leadership of the Western barbarian nations. When Clovis triumphed, he received a letter from Anastasius granting him the title of imperial consul. This was an unprecedented honor for the Franks of the Merovingian dynasty, and Clovis reveled in his success and celebrated on a grand scale. He was close to ruling an empire that encompassed what is today France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and the eastern part of the Elba in Germany. After Clovis' death, his kingdom was divided among his four sons, and when it came to Dagobert, the Merovingian dynasty began to decline. At the end of the dynasty, the kings of the Franks had only a name, but the real power was in the hands of the court ministers. As the court minister of the Franks, Pepin of Herstal extended his power over the whole kingdom. When his grandson Pepin the Short succeeded to the throne, Pepin twice attacked the Lombards, who threatened the church, and gave the church the land from Ravenna to Rome in order to gain God's approval, which led to the church's first territory. In 768, Pepin the Short died and was succeeded by his son, the future Charlemagne. The Romanization of Frankish culture was completed during Charlemagne's reign, but he remained a true barbarian ruler, wearing tribal rather than Roman clothing.
Charlemagne modeled his rule on the biblical King David and adopted the Byzantine emperor's style of secular rule. In 778, Charlemagne led an expedition across the Pyrenees to Spain. This expedition was later adapted for literature as Song of Roland. The story of Charlemagne and the Paladins was popularized even more than Knights of the Round Table. In 799, rival Roman nobles accused Pope Leo III of crimes and imprisoned him. Afterward, Pope Leo III fled Rome and defected to the Charlemagne-controlled city of Paderborn, granting Rome's civil authority to its protector, Charlemagne. From then on, the king and the church became allies, and the church portrayed Charlemagne as a messenger under the banner of St. Peter, and on Christmas Day, 800, crowned Charlemagne as Roman Emperor. Charlemagne held the title of Augustus and Emperor, but he also retained the Germanic title of King of the Franks and Lombards. However, Byzantium considered the Western Roman Empire to be its own and did not recognize this coronation of Charlemagne. Charlemagne soon showed them the power of the Germans. In 802, he ordered his army to capture Venice, the important western trading port of the Byzantines. Soon after, the Eastern Roman Emperor sent his congratulations to the new Emperor of the West. Upon seeing Charlemagne's influence, the Bishop of Jerusalem wrote a letter to Charlemagne asking him to save this Christian holy place from the pagans, along with a flag and the key to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Although this request impressed Charlemagne, he knew that he was powerless to fight the war, and that the Saxons within his empire were often provocative. The Saxons lived in a hilly area between the Rhine and the Elbe. At the end of the 8th century, when the Roman Empire was divided, a part of the Saxons came to settle in the British Isles, and in Germany only in the remote areas of the north and the east, the Saxons still dominate. When they learned that the Frankish army was stationed on the borders of Italy and Spain, the Saxons crossed the borders and expelled and killed many clergymen. Charlemagne knew that if the Saxons were not conquered, there would be no peace in his empire. As early as 772, Charlemagne began to wage war against the Saxons, and in 33 years Charlemagne waged eight campaigns against the Saxons. He used all means, sometimes bribes to make the tribal leaders betray, but often cruel and barbaric means to suppress the Saxons, once 4,500 rebel Saxons were beheaded. By the time of his death in 814 AD, Charlemagne had built an empire so vast that it stretched from Denmark to the Pyrenees and south of Rome, from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to the Baltic Sea and Bohemia in the east. Charlemagne tried to realize the ancient Roman ideal of putting Europe under one man's rule, but he also knew very well that it was his strong character that held all parts of Europe together, and that if he were gone, everything would also be gone. So he didn't want to leave a unified empire inherited by one son, he intended to divide it among three sons. But two of those sons died before him, and Louis, the only one who survived, ended up inheriting the whole empire. The new emperor, Louis the Pious, was similar in stature to his father, but lacked the talents of Charlemagne. For the first sixteen years of Louis's reign, the Carolingian dynasty faced no danger, but prosperity and peace went up in smoke in the civil wars. When the empire was organized in 817, Louis the Pious appointed his eldest son, the 23-year-old Lothair, co-ruler and sole heir to the undivided Frankish center. The younger brothers Pepin and Louis received a smaller share of Aquitaine and Bavaria respectively. But trouble arose when Louis the Pious married his second wife Judith of Bavaria and had a fourth son, the future Charles the Bald. For Judith, she could not imagine that her son's inheritance would be a relatively inexpensive gift. The sons, who had already divided the estate, feared that Judith, who had bewitched their father, would gain more than they had. A meeting held in 829 shocked them. Louis the Pious decided to create a new kingdom for Charles the Bald on his 16th birthday. This new kingdom included Alemannia, Kors, and a narrow strip of Burgundy belonging to Lothair. These decisions led to a rebellion in 830 by the older sons against their father. They arrested the emperor and young Charles in the palace, Judith was exiled and the three sons forced their father to declare the throne in favor of Lothair. At the end of this long and conflict-filled story, which left the Carolingian Empire permanently divided geographically and politically. Lothair, Louis and Charles the Bald after the death of Louis the Pious in 840, 
by which time Pepin was dead. In a fair division of their father's empire, there was further confusion and quarreling for three years, until the Treaty of Verdun was passed in 843. In the treaty, Lothair held the title of emperor and the central kingdom centered on the ancient capital of Aachen, roughly comprising today's Holland, Belgium, Switzerland, and Italy. Louis the German, who was given the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, equivalent to today's Germany. Charles the Bald, whose birth triggered the Frankish family feud, ruled the western part of the empire, roughly equivalent to present-day France.